Hey Axis and Allies players, the good captain here, and welcome to my seventh video in my 12 part series on Axis and Allies Anniversary Edition 1941 setup. This video will be the Japanese strategic video. Now, I know I'm going out of turn order here as Russia goes after Germany, but what I've decided to do is showcase all the Axis powers first and then do all the Allied powers. The reason I've decided to do this is because of flow. I think it will flow easier if I showcase all the Axis powers and their strategies first, and then we can switch and put our Allied hat on and see all of the Allied strategies. I think it will help with perspective. So though it's true that the Russian player has gone by this point in the game, there's very little that the player can do on its turn to affect what I'm about to show you as the Japanese player. But before we get into the video, let's take a quick moment and observe what's going on over here. It gives me the confidence to know that Russia is not going to be any kind of a problem to Japan's expansion on the first turn. And it has everything to do with this roundel. Well, not this roundel exactly, but what's under it. What's under it is not a Japanese emblem, but a Chinese emblem. That's why there's a roundel on a Japanese territory or what folks might think is a Japanese territory at the beginning of the game. Now there's a little domino effect here that's critical to why the Japanese player doesn't need to worry about whether Manchuria gets captured or not on the first round. So let's say that the USSR stacked everybody up in Buryatia on the first turn and you think, well, that doesn't look like I can ignore it. You certainly can. And I will pick up on this argument at the end of the game for now. Let's just bookmark this. Let's bookmark this, let's go through Japan's turn, and at the end of this video, I'll discuss this gamey little trick and how to exploit it. So let's talk about purchases. The four selections I have laid out here are purchases that I've seen made on the first turn for Japan. So we'll run through these real quick. It's a destroyer and a transport, save two in the top left. Two transports, save three. A transport and a fighter and then last and most popular a transport to infantry and artillery now my axiom every time I play as Japan I do the same purchase and that's two transports and save three and that's because I like to keep a certain option open for myself on turn two purchasing and because in my strong opinion Transports as the Japanese player are almost never a bad build. So I'm going to go ahead and purchase two transports and save three. And I'll talk more about this in the place units phase when we've done all the combat and non-combat and you can see better why I make this purchase. Of all my strategic videos, I'm the most adamant about Japan's. I think that this one of all the powers really does have an ideal opening combat move. So I just want to plant that flag there and now we will begin. I'm going to break this up like I did in the last video into parts. We'll start with the Eastern Pacific and that is the Pearl Harbor attack. So I think that the Axis and Allies developers did a great job, at least in this little opener here. It's December 1941. The Japanese are about to launch their Pearl Harbor strike. But there are a few options as the Japanese player to take a bigger risk or not. So let's start with the basic attack. Obviously, we have the Kido Butai up here in C Zone 57, ready to come down and strike. Conveniently, we have a destroyer in C Zone 51 to take the hit off the battleship if the battleship should get a hit. So the very basic Pearl Harbor attack looks like this. Move one destroyer into C Zone 53, and then of course all four fighters. This is a 100% chance of success battle. The question is whether you take zero casualties, one casualty, in which case you lose the destroyer, or two casualties, in which case you also lose a fighter if for some reason it went to a second round of combat and the battleship got a second hit. That's really the only question there. But for those players who are willing to be just a little more bold or are more attuned to the statistics, there is a second option here, and that is to hit C-Zone 56 as well as C-Zone 53. And all one has to do in this case is pull two fighters out and move them into C-Zone 56. Now, 
These battles are not 100% anymore, but they're close to it. So let's go over the statistics. So we'll start with Pearl Harbor proper. This is actually a 90% chance of success now instead of a 100%, a 4% chance of a draw in which all the combat units are destroyed, and a 6% chance of a loss. In exchange for this though, you now get a good crack at this destroyer transport combination at a 95% chance of a win, a 2.5% chance of a draw, and a 2.5% chance of a loss. Now if you're playing the table in Vegas, this is the move you make. And if you're playing competitively, this is the move you make. You're giving up a 100% chance at destroying a battleship, it's true, but these percentages are still very much in the attacker's favor, and the ability to inflict even more grievous damage on the Americans at the outset of the game is paramount. Now I'm not one to make historical comparisons between Axis and Allies and what actually happened or could have happened in history, but I'll just take a pause here and say it really is interesting to note that the Japanese did have an option to launch another wave of attacking planes against Pearl Harbor and with historical hindsight it probably would have been beneficial for them to do so. So this little option to me is really neat in terms of uh, historical what ifs. What if the Japanese had stuck around to do more damage? And this game did a beautiful job of recreating that by separating the combat units into two different sea zones, but still making them accessible to Japanese air power. And now we're gonna discuss some of the tasks that need to be completed in the Southwest Pacific area. So the first and most obvious is the seizing of East Indies and Borneo, also known as the Money Islands. And the simplest way to do this is to utilize the troops and transports in and around the Carolina Islands. And the way I like to do this is to load the odd man out infantry and move him to the East Indies. And I'll explain why in a moment. And then of course take the other transport and move him to Borneo. And the reason I like to load and move the single infantry into the East Indies is for the following reason. I'm already projecting out to turn two to give myself the option of capturing French Madagascar. And the most efficient way to do this is utilizing the transport and infantry in C Zone 38. One, two, offload. Okay, not that we have to do this, but I like to leave myself the option of doing this. If I had two infantry in here, unless I had a plan to use two infantry somewhere else on turn three, I don't need two infantry to take over French Madagascar. I just need the one. So that's why I just bring one into East Indies and leave two in Borneo. Both of these sea zones can hit India on their turn two if they would rather do that. Both can hit Australia, New Guinea, the Solomons, okay? So there's no reason in my mind uh, to bring two into the East Indies. The next task is to sink the Asiatic fleet in Sea Zone 50. So to do this, we just need to bring down the Japanese battleship and cruiser. There's no need to run the odds on this. This is 100%. And the final box to check here is to send both fighters on this last carrier here into Sea Zone 35 for one, two, three. And Yes, we will only have one movement point left here. So if they survive, the carrier will have to move down into C zone 37 in the non-combat movement phase. There's no difference between this battle and the battle off the west coast. So it's 95% chance of success, 2.5% draw, 2.5% loss. So this completes what I feel must be done on J1. There's still some units and territories to take over, but there's not a consensus on how to do that. So I'm gonna save that for last. Let's move now to China. And in China, we see for the first time a lack of consensus among the competitive players on the accessandallies.org website at least. So I'm gonna show you my preferred method of how to deal with China, and then we'll conclude the combat movement phase by discussing the options for the remaining pieces yet to move. So what I consider to be sort of a solid opening move in China is the following. I move two infantry out of Manchuria into Suiyan. I move two infantry out of Kyongsu into Hupei. 
and then one infantry from Kyongsu into Fukien, one infantry out of Thailand into the same. So now there's only two infantry in Thailand. And then we support each of these attacks into China with a single fighter. And those are our last three fighters. And these fall into place like so. From Japan, one, two, three, into Suiyan. And then from Formosa, one, two, and then from Manchuria, one, two, into Hupei. And that's a basic strategy in China. This is a solid and dependable thing to do. Even if we retreat when we only have fighters left, the odds on this one on all three battles are 97% victory, 0% draw. Again, we're retreating if there's a fighter, right? And then a 3% chance of defeat. So pretty solid all around there. But we still have transports that haven't moved with equipment on them here and here, and then one up here that can take off two units in Japan. So what are we gonna do with those? And this is where there's no preferred method. So I'll show you what I like to do, and then we'll discuss options that I've seen other players do. So there's some decisions that need to be made with the remaining transports. However, if you're playing with national objectives, it's more clear cut. What the Japanese player really must do is ensure that that Kuang Tung and the Philippine Islands get secured. This is necessary for one of their national objectives. If you're not playing with national objectives, then you have the option of taking the Philippines or doing what I prefer to do, and that's concentrate forces in Burma. So the way I like to roll this out is to move both these transports here in 61 down to 37 and unload into Burma. And now we're gonna take this final transport and load up an armor and an infantry and hit Kuang Tung. The final pieces that we've yet to move are the two infantry in Thailand and the safest thing to do is split them up send one into Kuang Tung and one into Burma. Now this strategy ignores the Philippines and you might be wondering well why did I do this? Well the Philippines are within our interior lines and they're not going anywhere. These two allied infantry are going to be on a prison camp after this turn we just won't collect those two IPCs and the USA will and that's fine. What I want to make sure with this strategy is that India goes down turn two, or at least that there's a good chance that India goes down on J2. I'll also point out that this Chinese infantry cannot come into French Indochina. That's a rules restriction from the rule book. They cannot leave the Chinese territories. So this is my preferred opener, but there is another option that I must demonstrate, and that is taking out the Chinese fighter on J1. Attacking Yunnan on the first turn means that you must send at least two infantry from French Indochina, Thailand into Yunnan, which means those aren't troops going in to help out in Burma. And you're also going to need at least one and probably two fighters to go into Yunnan and clear it out with those infantry, which means you're weaker on the Chinese front. So you can calibrate this a little bit and shift the transport loads a little bit, but I'm okay with letting this Chinese fighter and infantry get away. The Chinese troops themselves are more or less a speed bump on the way to Moscow. And on Russia's turn, I'll talk about the Qinghai defense. But for now, I just wanted to demonstrate my preferred opener and briefly discuss some of the, the other options from other players that I've seen while playing this game. So this is quite the opener as Japan, right? There's a lot going on. So a good question might now be, what kind of losses can we expect here? Let's start by looking at just the naval battles, specifically the naval battles with aircraft. So that's the battle off the west coast, Pearl Harbor, and the British here in the Indian Ocean. Across these three battles, it's very highly likely that you'll lose a single fighter. And sometimes you might lose two fighters. If you lose zero fighters, you can consider yourself very lucky. If you lose three fighters, I would say you can consider yourself very unlucky. But even if we lost three fighters, you're still pulling 50 IPCs off the board just in these three naval battles alone. Do yourself the favor of always committing these three attacks. So in our hypothetical world, it's the end of the combat movement phase and we have been a little bit generous to the Allies. We've lost two fighters in the naval battles, one in season 35, 
one along with the destroyer in C zone 53. And in the land battles, we've lost three infantry, one in Sui Hyun, one in Hupei, and one in Burma. So now it's the non-combat movement phase, and we'll do the simplest moves first. First, this fighter out in C zone 35 must land on a carrier in C zone 37, so let's do that. Next, we're going to land the Pearl Harbor Strike Force. This can be a little bit interesting, but I just like to pull both these carriers back to C zone 62. And the reason you need to send at least one carrier with a fighter back to C zone 62 is because, believe it or not, this bomber off the west coast can fly into C zone 62 and then on into Stanovage Chabret and sink your newly purchased transports. So you have to put at least one carrier and a fighter in there to protect them. You could move another carrier to Okinawa, uh, maybe Iwo Jima. These areas are not that interesting to me. It doesn't really change the amount of access to the rest of the board than just stockpiling everything in 62. The only other sea zone that might be worth noting is the Carolyn Islands. And why I don't like to put carriers in this sea zone is because it's really a huge dead zone. Check this out. You have a fighter in Hawaii, you have a carrier with a fighter on it down in 44, and you have a fighter and a bomber on the west coast, and all of that can hit the Carolyn Islands sea zone, so I generally avoid this. And I just realized I made a small mistake in my combat movement phase. The transport that picked up that armor and infantry in sea zone 62 and brought it into Kuang Tung should not have picked up a Japanese infantry off of Japan. It should have gone into the Okinawa Sea Zone, pulled the infantry off there, and then landed. And finally, we're going to move the two fighters with two movement points into French Indochina Thailand. And depending on what the Russians have done up here, we'll either move this final fighter into Manchuria or Kyongsu. But before I move that final piece, let's discuss this very briefly. So. It's very unlikely that you'll see anything like a heavy Russian presence in Buryatia. In fact, you might see no Russian presence. They might be already on their way back. If there is no presence, of course you would push this Manchurian infantry into Buryatia. There's no reason not to pick up this IPC. It's highly unlikely the Russians are going to counterattack, and in my opinion, that's a mistake as the Russian player. What is most likely to have happened is that a blocker will have been left in Buryatia. And now it's okay to move this fighter here and you're golden. But if they did go heavy or they put them all in, whatever, this would not be where you'd want to place this fighter. You'd want to place it in Kyongsu. My final note is that if they went heavier than two infantry up here, I would have just included this infantry in the attack into Suiyan. Either way, he just leave Manchuria blank. And why is that? Well, at the end of this turn, we're going to have two transports here, a large air force staged and ready. If the Russians attack into Manchuria or hold in Buryatia, they're just going to get wiped out and they won't have slowed up the Japanese at all. And they won't have collected any IPCs again because this goes to China. And since Japan goes right after Russia, the Chinese will never enjoy the fact that this territory was liberated for them. I'm going to quickly revisit why I purchased two transports. And if it's not obvious, it's because of how many units we started with at the beginning of the game. We have four infantry on Japan, one artillery, and one infantry on Iwo Jima. This is six units altogether, and now we have three transports, which is perfectly balanced with regards to the amount of stuff that we have on the board. A lethal player is an efficient player, and I just like to be especially efficient as the Japanese. So now we're going to talk about the turn two purchasing strategy and logistics overall for the Japanese player. And I feel so strongly about this part of the video that I would say that if you learned nothing else from this, I'd hope that this sticks because I feel like this is the most important part of playing this power. So yes, we're going to build two industrial complexes. We'll either save for, buy an infantry or buy an artillery as is needed. But the important thing is where these industrial complexes go and the logistics supply lines that we're going to create after we place them. So the first one will go down into the East Indies. And from J3 onwards, we're going to produce two transport loads of 
stuff every turn and so we'll need a dedicated pair of transports down here to constantly shuck them into either India or Southeast Asia, wherever they're needed. That's the simplest logistical supply line to explain. The second industrial complex will go up in Manchuria. So this one's pretty simple and pretty straightforward. This is a very popular build, putting an industrial complex in Manchuria and then cranking out three units a turn and sending them across China because that's the quickest route to the USSR. One, two, three, four, right? And then we're adjacent to Moscow. Pretty self-explanatory. And the third and final and perhaps most important supply line stems from the Japanese industry itself. This has a lot to do with the geography of the map. So if you didn't know this, let me be the first to tell you that the quickest way to Moscow is through the top of the board. If you can get two and eventually three and hopefully even four transports dedicated to shucking to the Soviet Far East every turn, you'll be tossing four loads of transports into the Soviet Far East and then having them move one, two, three spaces before they're adjacent to Russia. So with that very important discussion about logistics out of the way, we can now talk about mid and long range expectations and goals for this power. And we'll start here in the Pacific. Now what I see most of the competitive players on the accessandallies.org website doing is vacating the Pacific as the allies and leaving it to the Japanese. This means that as the Japanese player, you need to pick up the Philippines, New Guinea, Australia, New Zealand, and Hawaii over the course of the next two to three turns. So really by turn four, you wanna have this all mopped up. You can expect the British to pull an artillery and an infantry out of Australia or two pieces of some sort and head east out of the battle area and towards Africa. The American units generally head out through the Panama Canal and join up with other units in the Atlantic. If the allies don't play ball in this way, it's a very good thing for the Axis powers. The more money the Americans sink into C-Zone 56 to go into the Pacific, the less pressure Germany has placed on them and the easier time they'll have on the East Front. This is compounded by the fact that C-Zones are never worth any money. There are no convoys to disrupt and there are no territories worth anything out here until you get as far as New Zealand or Okinawa. So again, this is just a bad strategy as the American player, or at the very least, I haven't seen a working strategy yet. This area of the board, the Indian Ocean area, this is a much more dynamic battlefield in the mid and in the long game. You can eventually expect to have the balance of your fleet in C-Zone 34, battling around the Middle East and on the East territories of Africa. It's highly likely that India will fall. The question is, will the Allies invest enough time and effort to try to make it inhospitable to you? It's not always clear if the Japanese can or should place an industrial complex there. In other words, you might be swapping this, depending again on how much the Allies want to try to hold on to it. However, if you do secure India, you should put an industrial complex on there and add the units it produces to the logistics efforts already in place. In China and Russia, you can expect to simply roll up these territories. The only difficulty is how long it takes to get to these choke points, and the choke points will be Qinghai and Novosibirsk. Not all my opponents decided to defend Qinghai, but it is a critical piece of ground. This is the last stop for all Chinese units, and if you've got enough of them, the Russian player should consider heavily whether to defend this as a doorway to the Russian Empire, obviously defending one territory is better than defending two. Alternatively, the Russians can fall back or create a defense in Novosibirsk and try to dead zone the surrounding territories, preventing Japanese armies from linking up. But you can expect to eventually overpower them. The Japanese become a very, very strong and overpowering force by the late game. It is very difficult to fight against this or to stem the tide as the allied player. So my final comments on Japan are something like, get your transports up to at least what you have on the board here, which is seven. You'll need to take out all these Pacific islands just as quick as you can after turn one. And then you wanna to try to get up to four transports up here to shuck up to the Soviet Far East. And you'll need two down here, so that's six. And you'll want a few more to extend your reach in the Indian Ocean to fight in Africa and the Middle East. 
My other note is get your industrial complexes up and running just as quick as you can. And eventually you'll want to build another industrial complex, probably in India, but if the allies are putting up a stiff fight here, Burma works nearly just as well. And a good barometer for when to do that is once you've outstripped your production. In other words, with these three industrial complexes, you can build 15 units per turn, 15 land units per turn, and you really should. However, when you're doing that and you have money left over, yes, you can buy fighters and boats and other fun tools, but you really should consider purchasing another industrial complex somewhere here and making even more ground units. You want to overwhelm and suffocate the Russians and the allies in Africa over here and just dominate the board. This power is the hammer to Germany's anvil, and Russia is the thing you're hitting. To get that hammer swinging harder, you need more ground units. Get more bodies to the front. Well, this concludes my Japanese strategic video. Let me know what you think about this video in the comments section below, or let me know what your strategies are as the Japanese player. Thanks for watching this. All the best from the good captain and bye-bye.